All right, welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're going to be taking a look at the monolith from beyond space and time. Uh, but before we begin, I have a quick two announcements to make. Uh, number one, the Questing Beast t-shirt store is now open. Uh, I've discovered that there are very few good OSR themed t-shirts out there. So I decided to create a whole bunch of them. I have a good 10 different designs. I will put a link down in the description below where you can check them out. And hopefully you'll find something that you like. It's a great way to support the channel and uh, wear something cool. Announcement number two is that my latest one-page dungeon, which I make once per month, is going to be coming out in the next couple days, probably. Uh, that is for patrons only, so if you want to get in on that, you can head over to my Patreon and uh, subscribe. All right, let's move on to our review. Uh, the Monolith from Beyond Space and Time is a Lamentations of the Flame Princess adventure written by James Raji, and it is a adventure for levels one through infinity. Uh, basically, the level of your character does not matter. Um, just because of the nature of the adventure itself. So uh, James talks about how the inspiration for this adventure was definitely H.P. Lovecraft. But this is not an adventure with Cthulhu or really any other references to the Lovecraft mythos. Instead, what he does is he takes the themes of Lovecraft, of cosmic horror and dimensions beyond what man can comprehend, and spins an adventure around that. So don't tell your players that it's Lovecraft themes. They may not Lovecraft themed rather, they may not even notice, um, but it will definitely evoke some of those emotions, or at least that's the goal here. The main principle is that a valley has suddenly appeared in your campaign setting. Um, I should point out right away that I would advise against running this as an adventure on its own. Instead, what I would do is use this book to place this valley and this monolith somewhere in your setting and give it as a option that players can travel to. And make sure to have plenty of rumors surrounding it about how dangerous and how horrible it is. Because it's a really horrible place. Players will almost certainly be unalterably changed. And your campaign may also be changed as the result of this uh, adventure. So have it there. Have it horrible. Um, but don't force players to go there. Because some of them may resent you for it. But for players who want to go there, they may have a really good time. So there's a large valley. And the size of it depends uh, on uh, random tables. So it could be anywhere from um, a unit, the units measuring the distance across could be feet, you know, miles, leagues, or even astronomical units. So this thing could be the size of a solar system uh, once you start entering the valley itself. There's a lot of spatial and uh, temporal distortion effects all throughout this adventure, where space and time and direction and up and down are not quite what you would expect them to be. So it's going to take a talented referee to be able to describe that in a way that's evocative to the players and also gets across basically what's going on. Because eventually you're going to get some weird contradictory effects that are going to be very hard to describe. That could be one challenge to running this. There's a bunch of weird effects that are going to happen once you enter the valley. For example, life slows. You can have random mutations. You can have time moving backwards, time moving forwards more quickly weather out of time, wish fulfillment effects. And then we have some locations and encounters within the valley, including the mist, uh, the owl service, which is a little adventure or a little location written by Kenneth Height um, about th th these weird owl statues that suddenly appear and trap you and then start haunting your dreams. Um, very creepy. We have a plateau that you can try to jump off of. Uh, and if you jump off the plateau to the ground, nothing happens, you're perfectly fine. But if you try and crawl down or use ropes or some other method, then things get harder and harder for you. So there's a lot of out of the box, counterintuitive stuff that happens. We have things like shadows of the past and future. Uh, we have a terror from the deep, a massive sea monster that arises out of a shallow stream running through the setting or running through the valley. We have the monolith itself. So the monolith is where the real adventure is. Um, we have effects for seeing the monolith. It, there's weird effects like it always appears to be uh, 20 or 30 feet tall. Even if you start flying higher for some reason to try and you know, get over it, you can't. It always appears to be taller than you. There are, there's a guardian and invisible or possibly not even existent creature that starts attacking you when you get near it. And your body becomes invaded by tons of tiny little creatures that give you advantages and some pretty horrible disadvantages once you even look at the monolith. By getting near the monolith, you can actually travel inside of it. And it is, a again, a place beyond time and space. 
So there are very strange rules for what it looks like and how you navigate it, which is mostly through pure thought. There's some great examples of here of how travel th uh, within the monolith actually works. That's another great thing I love about Lamentations Adventures. They are written in the author's uh, tone, so you get a sense of their personality. And there's lots of comments and notes about how play tests of this went, so you get a sense for what players might actually do. We have some inhabitants within the monolith, which are monsters from another dimension, so fighting them is very weird. Um, and we have a number of locations, including a control room. Basically, you travel to these locations just by thinking about them. The if you want to go to a control room or a command center of some uh, sort, you basically travel inside your own mind, and other players can travel there too. So there's a whole bunch of different effects and descriptions for what happens when you're inside your own brain or when you travel to inside other people's brains. And this is, I guess, uh, one possible criticism of this um, is that there's a lot of variables, right? Depending on where you're going, uh, what you say to the DM, uh, what things you try when you're in, in different combinations. So like, what if you go inside someone else's brain and then they leave their brain and then they try and get back again, right? This book takes into account those sorts of scenarios with different mechanics. And keeping all of that straight could be a little bit tricky uh, for uh, DMs. I would like some sort of flow chart, perhaps, that gives you like a, a series of steps where if this happens and then this happens, then this thing is the way it resolves. Because as it is right now, there's just a lot of text and it can be very difficult to sift through it to find exactly where the ruling is that you need for how this stuff works out. Now, if I was running it myself, I would probably skim through the book, probably read it more than once, and then run it more or less by the seat of my pants, create my own internal rules for how this sort of thing works and make judgment calls. I think that would speed things up and prevent me from spending a lot of time just looking through the book. You can get to the exit and possibly close off the monolith to the outside world. Uh, and there's a lot of incredibly powerful effects throughout the monolith. If you harness things correctly, you can travel across time and space to other dimensions, other worlds, and even into other adventures and other RPG systems. For example, if players are looking for an adventure and they just wish to be there, the DM should go to their uh, shelf and pull off a random RPG book, adventure really, flip to a random page and say, that's where they are now. And then they have to survive from that point, which is delightfully gonzo, I think. Uh, but keep in mind that that is the sort of adventure that this is. It's one that is not uh, based on fairness or balance. There's a lot of uh, very powerful effects that can wildly change the game in one direction or another. So you really have to have a table and players that are on board with that sort of thing. We have the head of Carter Holmes, an extremely powerful wizard trapped in a bell jar who wants you to kill him and who can give you all sorts of powerful effects if you eat part of his brain, which I thought was pretty funny. There we go. It's not a very long book. It's very succinct. It is very focused on the feeling that it is trying to give you, which is weirdness, uh, Lovecraftian horror, a sense of disorientation, and of being vastly out of your depth. It offers enormous potential to player characters in that if they play their cards right, and if they're smart enough, they can have enormously powerful effects and control over the setting uh, after completing this adventure. But more likely than not, horrible things will happen to the players. They probably will not survive. They could be trapped in places beyond their comprehension for eternity. So it's a Lovecraft adventure in that sense. So as I said before, I would put it somewhere in your setting and I would give players clues about the sort of thing that it is and so that they are duly warned. And if they want to have that sort of adventure, then they can. It's definitely a change of pace from what you typically see in most RPG adventures in the sense that it is providing a really dangerous, uh, horrific place with its own rules that you can try and understand, but you may not be able to. So it gives that visceral sense of a real danger that um, is not playing by game rules. It's playing by its own internal rules. And I like that about it. Anyway, that's it for my review of The Monolith from Beyond Time and Space. Um, thanks for watching. If you want to support uh, the show, you can, as I said before, check out my Patreon page. And thanks especially to Timmy Jacobs, who recently became a $10 subscriber. Thanks, Timmy. That is an amazing gift to give to the channel. It's a great help and a support for um, what I do here. So thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next Wednesday when I will be doing a review of Blood in the Chocolate, which is a Willy Wonka-esque adventure 
uh, for Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and it won the Any Award for Best Adventure last year. So I'm really looking forward to digging into this. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you guys later.